Welcome to this morning's session. Um, and thank you for coming at such an early time. Um, my name is Mark Corson, and I'm a biochemical geneticist or a metabolic geneticist um, trained out of pediatrics. And I'm here because um, there are not enough of us metabolic physicians, uh, you know, in practice. And so patients who have metabolic disorders, um, they often go a long time before a diagnosis is made um, because my colleagues, including emergency room physicians, are not well trained in the area of metabolic disease. And so sometimes these patients show in the emergency room and um, they're not recognized. And so what I'm here to do this morning is to discuss the metabolic crisis, uh, specifically focusing in on uh, disorders with ammonia, how to identify and treat them. So this morning it's, uh, it is me who's speaking, but we have also with us um, John and Renee Zaleski, who are actually parents of a child with a urea cycle disorder. So this is gonna get very personal, and it's like having a, a case history unfold in front of us this morning. We have no uh, disclosures uh, to report, and there we do have accreditation for one uh, uh, credit, <clears throat> category one credit. So the learning objectives this morning are really to identify those symptoms that suggest a metabolic crisis. And these are not necessarily unique to a, a urea cycle disorder. Um, many of the symptoms overlap with other disorders. Uh, what are those tests that, should, that can raise or lower your concerns about a metabolic crisis? Um, how to implement practical treatment strategies. You don't have to know about sort of complicated therapies. There's some very basic treatment strategies that work. Um, and then develop a plan to get help if you suspect a patient who has a possible metabolic disorder. Practically, the objectives are how to spot a candidate, what might be the triggers, how do you build a case for a diagnosis, what labs do you need, how do you can start first aid, which can be life-saving, and who to call for help. And again, um, I'm, um, we are all very fortunate to have um, Zoe's parents with us this morning. So again, why is this training important for those who just came in? Uh, because these patients, patients who present with acute metabolic disease, present to you before they present to us. Yes, we are the metabolic doctors and they have a metabolic disorder, but often they don't present to us. So uh, you have to know something about this. What makes things worse is that there's a worldwide shortage of metabolic clinicians. So it's not as if we're sort of roaming around making diagnoses all the time. We often just don't get to see these patients, at least early on. And teaching about metabolic disease is poor in medical schools and postgraduate training. So very few, especially adult medicine specialists, uh, consider these diagnoses. They don't know, they don't know who Mark, Cor they don't know who I am, and I don't mean Mark Corson. They don't know that a biochemical geneticist exists. And that's part of the problem and part of our, um, mission is to increase awareness about us. So, onward. Metabolic disorders frequently masquerade as other common diseases. And so, uh, nutritional deficiencies like B12 deficiencies can cause rises of methylmalonic acid. Drugs, toxins, alcohol can cause encephalopathy, can, you know, mimic a metabolic disorder. Infections like encephalitis, endocrinopathies, adrenal or thyroid insufficiency can manifest symptoms that overlap with metabolic disease. Certainly neurologic conditions and psychiatric conditions, as I'll, as I'll mention to you later, um, can mimic uh, metabolic disease. And then, of course, uh, Munchausen or Munchausen by proxy. But the point being, people think of more common diseases before they'll think of metabolic diseases. Um, the problem is many metabolic diseases are very treatable. Um, and, so, and you never, at the end of the day, want to miss a treatable disorder. So Jean-Marie Sotobray, the preeminent uh, metabolic clinician in Europe, uh, classified metabolic disease into three. Disorders of intoxication, disorders of energy metabolism, where there's a problem making energy or utilizing energy, and then disorders of complex molecules. So the lysosomal, the peroxisomal, the glycosylation, all those disorders. What we're talking about today are really disorders that intoxicate the brain. And there's a differential diagnosis of that. Um, the urea cycle disorders on top, but many of the amino acidopathies, PKU, maple syrup urine disease, the organic acid disorders, fatty acid oxidation defects, homocystine anemias, and so, sort of a range of them, Wilson disease, porphyria, 
All these are intoxicating disorders. So with that as an introduction to metabolic disease and acute and how they can um, present acutely, let me introduce John Zaleski, who will introduce us, introduce us to Zoe. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me all right. Um, just a, a, a quick warning. I'm not a professional presenter, so please bear with me. Um, unfortunately, Zoe uh, couldn't be with us today, so I'm going to present her slides on her behalf. And I'm going to do it in a, a little unique way. I'm, I'm going to talk to you as if I am actually uh, Zoe here to present her slides to you. So I was born on February 26, 1996 in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Uh, my family had just moved from Canada as a result of my dad's job. Uh, at the time, I had an older sister named Alicia. And uh, when I was born, I was described by many as being extremely robust. And I would forever be known as the, uh, the family Oki. Uh, two, two very prominent memories I have from when I was born, actually, in the, the birthing room itself. You have to understand, when I was born, uh, taking videos was not done on a phone. We were still using video cameras with, that were quite large. And I can remember the doctor turning to my dad and saying, hey, camera boy, you want to cut the cord? And uh, so that, that was quite memorable for me during my birth. Um, my real trouble started in 1998. My parents had since moved the family from Oklahoma to Calgary, Canada, and from Calgary back to Houston. And uh, we also welcomed my partner in crime, my little brother, Noah, at that time. Around this time, I developed some very interesting characteristics. Uh, I loved to talk ex extremely loud. Uh, I loved my Barbie collection and playing with my dad whenever he was at home and I had the opportunity. I loved being in pictures. Uh, I demanded everyone's attention, and, and in fact, at one time, my, my parents thought I was uh, part Italian because I'd always look at my mom and say, Mama, look at your face, to try to get her attention. I loved the color pink, and uh, I could eat a whole hot dog without consuming the bun, which was a, a skill set that, uh, 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 to this day, my, my parents can't understand how I actually did it. Uh, besides the wiener dog in my life, uh, I would never eat meat which was uh, something from a very early age. I just never did. Uh, by 2000, we were back to Canada and then back to Houston again. Uh, we traveled a lot. We moved 11 times in 14 years. And wherever we were, my mom made a great home wherever we were. Uh, we celebrated every possible kid holiday there was on the calendar to its absolute fullest. Uh, I was always the one that made friends wherever we were. It did not matter. I was extremely outgoing. And when Dad would come home from traveling, I just remember always running to him as quick as I could, jumping up high, grabbing him by the neck, and, and almost uh, pulling him down. Uh, interestingly, though, in 2000, I, I still would refuse to eat meat. And uh, although Mom makes sure we go to our wellness checks every year, er everything's fine. There, there are no issues. But of course, there's starting to be a frustration with, with my parents, especially my dad, uh, with my, in, my unwillingness to eat any meat in my diet. In the early 2000s, I did the normal kid stuff. I played soccer and baseball. I was in girl guides. Uh, I did gymnastics and swim team. Uh, however, I did not like doctor visits and especially needles. At uh, one of my doctor's appointments, um, I was going to have to get a shot and I told my mom that I had to go to the bathroom and as soon as I got out of the, uh, the waiting office I tried to find the nearest exit door and as I was actually going out the exit my mother realized it was taking me too long. She came running out and saw me trying to escape from the doctor. Uh, I was a real happy kid uh, but all of a sudden this not eating meat and protein thing is starting to get a pretty negative reaction as I said earlier from my parents. Uh, by 2004, I had quite the personality and drive. Academically, I did well in school, but I did have to work a little harder than my older sister and my younger brother. Uh, the academic side of things didn't come early. Uh, I gave up at absolutely nothing. Uh, one year, uh, my dance partner and I practiced for almost four months for the, the, uh, the Christmas holiday show, and um, the actual night of the holiday show, she didn't show up. And uh, so the dance teacher came up to my, my mother and me and said, you know, Zoe, do you still want to go on with this? And I said, yep. 
And away I went. I did my dance routine all by myself. And uh, of course, my, my parents sat there crying because they felt so bad that the other girl uh, didn't show up for the event. Uh, by this time, I've started to really like a good Caesar salad, and boy, do I love popcorn. Uh, not sure what the problem is, though, uh, but I seem to get nauseous and vomit every once in a while. Uh, my dad says I must be eating too much popcorn whenever this happens. Uh, I had a blood test which showed somewhat high cholesterol, and again, now dad says I'm still not eating a well-balanced diet, and I've got to start eating some meat and get some protein in my diet. In 2006, we're, we're now in Dallas, and I solidified my position uh, in the family as the fashion expert and the technology leader. I had the first iPod and first flip phone in our family, and if any, any other new technology ever came out, uh, I was, of course, the first in line in our house to get it. Uh, I also fell in love with acting. I had a very uncanny ability to memorize lines, and so even though I had to work extremely hard at academics in school, when it came to the school play, uh, I learned enough lines to have the lead of Lucy in a play where, where I spoke for almost continuously for an hour and had memorized the, the entire script. Uh, my diet has expanded from Caesar salad and popcorn to now include tater tots and chips and dilly dip. Uh, dilly dip is a must in my diet and the chips and tots are just a delivery device for the dilly dip. Uh, for some strange reason, whenever I have a sleepover with a friend, I get sick and vomit and it just must be too darn much popcorn again. Okay, we're going to fast forward a little. I breezed through middle school and started high school, took some great family vacations. Uh, my parents took me to Paris, Hawaii, Dubai, and a couple of cruises, and uh, Hawaii is it for me. I mean, that, that, that's my special place, and I just love going to Hawaii. Uh, we also picked up two additional family members, two wiener dogs, Snickers and Twix, and since that we've also added uh, Hershey and Crunchy to the collection. Not sure what the problem is though, but halfway through the flight home from Paris, I'm sitting in an aisle seat across from my dad in another aisle seat, and I just look over at my dad and say, Dad, I'm gonna get sick, and I immediately vomit in the middle of the aisle on the, on the flight home from Paris. Of course, my dad is wondering, what the hell are you doing? You're, you're uh, almost 16 years old, you're starting to feel nauseous, and you can't get yourself to the uh, restroom at the back of the plane. Um, unfortunately, the flight attendants also felt the same way on the Delta airline and they were kind of extremely rude and forced us to clean up it ourselves and would have nothing to do with us or, or uh, the fact that I was not feeling well. Uh, same darn thing happened again where we were, we were checking in as a family at the uh, Moana Surfrider in Waikiki and my dad's up at the counter and he's checking us in and I'm standing beside my mom. I look over at my mom with a dazed face and I vomit all over the nice carpet of the, the uh, Weston Moana Surfrider. And uh, so again, this time my, my dad is, he's, he's pretty angry. He's again, Zoe, you know, why the heck can't you get yourself to the restroom if you're not feeling well? You obviously have some sort of motion sickness from the flight or actually the, the, his justification was it must have been that the, uh, the damn Caesar salad I ate out of the uh, cooler at the airport at LAX. Um, so had a great holiday, no issues during that trip to Hawaii. We're hopping in the, uh, the car to go back to the airport and all of a sudden I look over at my dad during the drive to the airport and guess what, I'm gonna get sick again and uh, roll down the window as, as quick as we can and as my head is hanging out the window and I vomit out the side of the window of the car, a homeless lady looks over at us and yells, ooh, catnip. By all accounts, life is good and everything is great. I absolutely love swim team. I made some lifelong friends. My friend Lauren, uh, I got a part-time job at Lifetime Fitness, and I got my dream vehicle for my 16th birthday. My dad bought me a Jeep, so li life was good. My sense of humor is, is totally out of control. Whenever I get a chance, I had my, hide my dad's lunch and it drives him mad. Uh, I graduated from Cinco Ranch High School in Houston as an AP scholar and a member of the National Honor Society. I was also accepted into the University of Arizona in Tucson pre-nursing program and started college in the fall of 2014. Uh, something is going on though. My, my personality is, is changing for some reason. Uh, I'm starting to be very irritable and extremely difficult to get along with at times. Uh, not the usual girl stuff, uh, no drugs, I don't drink, and I've never had a, a boy issue or a boyfriend. So. Not sure what's going on, but uh, I'm definitely becoming a very irritable individual. 
Uh, college life is everything I ever dreamed of. I met my new best friend, Mariah, from San Clemente, California, and I'm a member of Sigma Kappa Sorority. Early in September of 2015, I called home on a Saturday morning, and uh, my dad thought I had been drinking. But I don't do drugs, and I don't drink. I wasn't making much sense when I was speaking, just it seemed like I was very, very tired. That night, I went out for dinner with my sorority friends, and I got sick and vomited after eating. The girls called my mom and dad back in Houston uh, to tell them I was not making sense when I spoke, and they were taking me to the emergency room at Banner University Hospital in Tucson, Arizona. I spent many hours that evening in the emergency room. The doctors called my parents saying I was critically ill and they could not determine why I kept slipping in and out of consciousness. Communication from the hospital to my parents in Houston was an absolute nightmare. Infrequent telephone updates, no clarity around what the medical issue was, no clarity around whether we, they, my parents needed to fly there as quickly as possible, and uh, hours after hours of, of no information from the people working in the, the emergency. All the blood work came back inconclusive and an MRI showed that there was no issue with my brain activity. Uh, sometime around after midnight uh, with my older sister at my bedside who was also attending University of Arizona with me, uh, I started to become my normal self again and I was released from the hospital. Uh, the only thing I had had during that time was an IV and the physician suggested that I do a follow-up with a neurologist on the MRI just to double check but to also go and have my blood work done at the local lab because they thought my liver enzymes were a, a little out of whack. So everything came back negative, the IV seemed to work and again they said I must have just been dehydrated. On December 14, 2015, the night before Zoe was to come home for the holiday break, she'd, she called home saying she was not feeling well. We actually uh, uh, spoke to her via FaceTime. Her friend said that she was mumbling incoherently again, just like the episode back in September. We decided to make Zoe a doctor's appointment for the next morning before she hopped the plane to come back to Houston for, for Christmas. The next morning, my, my wife Renee called to make sure, sure Zoe was up for her appointment. Uh, she didn't answer her phone, she didn't respond to text message, and that was an actually a huge red flag for us because not a day or probably hour went by during every day that, that uh, Zoe and my wife Renee didn't have some sort of communication. We called Alicia, uh, Zoe's older sister, to go over to Zoe's dorm, dorm room and check on her. And uh, uh, with, with me on the phone from Houston, Alicia went over, she, uh, she grabbed the, uh, or she went up to the room, knocked profusely on the door, and no one would answer the door. I instructed Alicia to run and try to grab the manager of the building to let her in. And while I was still on the phone with her, Alicia and the building manager got into the room, found Zoe unconscious, and she had wedged herself uh, between the toilet and the bathroom sink in, in her dorm room. Uh, she had aspirated, her hair was wet, the water in the sink was still running, and her computer on her bed had been stopped halfway through a movie she had been watching on Netflix. Told Alicia to call 911 immediately and Zoe was taken to Banner University Medical Center in Tucson, Arizona. The hospital called Renee and I again telling us the same thing they had before that Zoe was critical, critically ill except for this time they told us that we needed to fly to Tucson as, as soon as possible. We flew separately and uh, Renee arrived in Tucson first and I arrived later that day after taking care of some things at home for Zoe's younger brother. As I walked into the intensive care room in the hospital, it was full of doctors. There was a pastor in there. Uh, Alicia, my wife Renee, and Renee was screaming at the top of her voice, what is wrong with her, what is wrong with her. Uh, she was in absolute uncontrollable convulsions, her arm and her left arm and her left leg uh, swinging uncontrollably in the air. Uh, her pupils went uh, fully, fully dilated and uh, they basically were giving her medication to try to stop the convulsion or, or what they may have thought was a seizure at that time from happening. 
Zoe would never regain consciousness again on December 23rd after almost 10 days in the ICU and a ferocious struggle. Uh, Zoe was pronounced uh, legally dead at Banner University Medical Hospital. In a complete act of selfishness, I suggested to Renee that, that we donate Zoe's organs so that we could at least spend two more days with her since there's a 48-hour window from when you make the decision as a parent to donate organs to when the, do the organs actually have to be harvested. Uh, again, we were fortunate that due to the inability of, of uh, the hospital to determine what was wrong with her, uh, it actually took the full 48 hours for uh, the hospital to ha find recipients for her organs because they could not say what was wrong with her. They finally just thought she had potentially gone into uh, some sort of cardiac arrest and uh, similar to what athletes sometimes have when they're uh, on the playing field, but maybe when she fell in the bathroom, her, her heart restarted again. Our last images of Zoe are walking with her by her bedside on Christmas Eve. As she was being wheeled in her bed to the OR, she was surrounded by doctors. They were manually keeping her breathing. And we watched the closing of the elevator doors as we said our final goodbyes to her. And we were both crying uncontrollably controllably at that time. On Christmas Day at approximately 3 a.m., Zoe died after giving the gift of life to three people. Her death certificate would state cause of death as cardiac arrest, and we would never know what happened to her at that time. All right, so go from the case to the phenotype. So what does a metabolic crisis look like? And the metabolic crisis, we're talking now about a urea cycle disorder, but it could be, again, organic acidemias, fatty acid oxidation defects. These patients often present with nausea and vomiting, lethargy, some sort of altered mental status, which if progresses, leads to dehydration, coma, and to potentially to death. These patients are often tachypneic, and we're all sort of instructed, gee, metabolic disorders, um, these kids often have a metabolic acidosis and they become tachypneic because they're trying to uh, blow off CO2 um, as a compensation for the acidosis. But the other thing to remember is that ammonia is a primary respiratory stimulant. It stimulates the brain to breathe and so active creates an, uh, a primary respiratory alkalosis. So a primary respiratory alkalosis is actually a relatively uncommon thing. Sure, you see with hyperventilation, you can see it with intracranial malformations and neonates. You can see it with intracranial injury in adults or older children. But ammonia is a cause for a primary respiratory alkalosis, and that's often the first biochemical sign. The mental status can be a range of things. It could be lethargy. It could be <clears throat> headaches, recurring headaches or migraines, uh, transient um, variable confusion or disorientation like Zoe showed or a full-blown mood disturbance, she did become quite irritable, or an all-out psychotic or a thought disturbance, or again, coma. As <clears throat> the patient becomes more systemically ill, you see um, as the brain becomes intoxicated and swollen, you see apnea, you see bradycardia, the seizures that were described, hypothermia, organs start to shut down, and sudden death can occur. In the past history, there may be a history of, of protein intolerance. Um, remember, um, many of these disorders are in the degradation pathways of amino acids. And so if you eat too much protein, your body uses what it needs and the extra goes down through these pathways and the, if it's blocked, the accumulating metabolites are intoxicating and cause symptoms. So patients tend to avoid protein noticeably and they get into battles over the dinner table as um, was described with Zoe here. Um, although sometimes you can be tricked. I was at once asked to see a patient, a 40-year-old man who came in and out of coma and it wasn't clear why he did, and they had, but he had a high ammonia. So they called me to see the patient and on the way to the, uh, seeing the patient, you know, I was going through in my mind those questions that I like to ask in these situations, which is one question is, what's your favorite food? Now usually with these patients who are protein intolerant, They'll say, um, they'll say pasta or bread because those are lower 
in their protein content. But this gentleman said he, his favorite food is a Big Mac. Now I'm thinking of Big Mac. Well, that has protein in it. Gee, that's not the answer that I would have thought of. But then he said, but if, it more, if I eat more than one Big Mac, then I throw up and fall asleep for three hours. Now say what you will about a McDonald's Big Mac. That should not be a response to eating two or three Big Macs. So uh, there, he, he, even he was protein intolerant. So, um, but some of these patients can present with sudden death. And crib death or sudden infant death syndrome is a clinical diagnosis. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to consider a range of things, including metabolic diseases. And there's a whole slew of metabolic disorders that can present rather suddenly after fasting with ordinary illnesses. And, it's not, and so it's not the trigger, the primary cause leading to death is not recognized. Um, so this is the, the, the potential phenotype um, of a, a metabolic crisis, but especially of a urea cycle disorder. So now what I'd like to do is present a, a, a visual story of, of Zoe. One sec. It's so really hard for me to describe Zoe in just a few words. Um, to me, she was just extraordinary. And I mean, I, I know I'm a little bit biased, obviously, but um, I think that anybody that met Zoe, I kind of thought the same thing. She was just unforgettable. Um, Zoe was a 19-year-old, almost 20-year-old. Uh, she was a student at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Um, she wanted to be a nurse. She died suddenly last December. Um, of an undiagnosed rare genetic disorder called OTC deficiency. In individuals who have mild forms of urea cycle disorders like Zoe, the patient may go unrecognized for years before diagnosis is made. And it's really not until a perfect storm of triggers comes together to produce a catastrophic uh, elevation in blood ammonia levels. Certainly, uh, the blood ammonia level, when it's elevated, if it's not recognized, uh, patients uh, may progress very quickly to coma and death. Patients can present with um, being lethargic or with GI symptoms like vomiting. Um, they can also pre present with seizures or personality changes and ultimately may lead to even coma. In her teens, she started to um, have these episodes of nausea and vomiting. They were completely um, random. She would just um, feel sick and, and be sick and then it would pass and we could never really quite figure out the cause of it. We talked to the doctor and um, but they weren't, you know, we thought maybe she had food allergies but nothing ever really seemed to, you know, nobody said it seemed like it was serious and it was so, like I said, it was so sporadic we couldn't really pinpoint anything. Now, looking back now it's easy to see that she avoided protein. Right after she went back to Tucson for her sophomore year, it was in September 2015, um, we got a call one night that uh, a few of her friends had taken her to the emergency room. Um, she had been really tired and 
the nausea and vomiting were continuing and the most worrying symptom was though that she was very very confused she couldn't um, she kept repeating herself and she was disoriented and she um, her text messages she would repeat them and they would be garbled At the hospital, they ran a, a variety of tests. They gave her blood tests and CAT scans and MRIs. And of course, they screened her for alcohol and drugs and it came back completely negative. They kept her for a few hours and they decided she was dehydrated and they, um, they gave her IV fluids and they released her with a, they gave her an anti-nausea medication and they, they sent her home. So we never really felt completely well again. Um, the next couple of months she continued to have struggle with the nausea and vomiting, always really tired and lack of energy. Um, my bubbly, enthusiastic girl was short-tempered and irritable a lot of the time and she just wasn't herself. There are certain triggers that increase the risk for high blood ammonia levels in patients with urea cycle disorders. These triggers may include things like a viral illness, an infection, going too long between meals, surgery, or uh, pregnancy or delivery, or even things like dehydration or excessive exercise. In addition, other well-known triggers include a protein-rich diet or even a protein-rich meal and gastric bypass surgery. A lot of times ammonia levels are drawn routinely in the ER setting uh, because uh, oftentimes doctors don't think about the diagnosis of a urea cycle disorder. Uh, these are in theory rare conditions uh, but because it's so easily detected and there are so many good treatments it's critical to be thinking about these conditions because the consequences can literally be, be life-threatening. Two days before she was uh scheduled to fly home for Christmas break. She was found unconscious in her apartment. Um, they rushed her back to the same hospital and they immediately suspected um, alcohol poisoning. But they did the, the blood, the, they checked her um, alcohol and drug level and there was absolutely nothing in her system. They gave her every kind of test you can imagine. She had so many doctors, neurologists and pulmonologists and infectious disease specialists and seizure experts and nobody could figure out what was wrong with her. She, during the whole time she was um, never given a blood ammonia test and uh, it's a simple test that would have measured the amount of ammonia that was in her blood and it would have probably pointed us in the direction of, of finding out what was wrong with her at that time but she never had that test. On December 24th, we said goodbye to Zoe and, and uh, Christmas was always Zoe's favorite holiday. So. All right. So what triggered, what went wrong? Uh, we talked a little bit about the symptoms, but, but what the, what's the trigger here? So let's consider physiology. And if anabolism is, the, is that process in which there's more energy coming in than the body needs, and that's what we use for growth, for building muscle and so on, um, then we're getting in a f calories from fat, carbohydrate, and protein. If we eat too much sugar or fat, our bodies store the extra. Extra protein, the body uses only what it needs and it gets rid of the rest. So, which, uh, which is probably why humans have evolved to eating three times a day. Because any food that cavemen ate in the morning, if he caught a deer and ate, uh, it wasn't going to last him through the afternoon. He had to eat again in the afternoon. So that is how protein is different. In catabolism, where there is not enough calories coming in to satisfy body demands, 
then the body starts to break down uh, its own stores and um, utilize them. But with protein, it doesn't do so in a particularly regulated way, so more is broken down than is often needed. Uh, but this is where you're going to find in the catabolic pathways, this is where you find all the classic uh, metabolic disorders. These are all in catabolic pathways. So the triggers of catabolism, well, prolonged fasting, obviously enough calories are not going to come in. Infection, your body is, is revving up to fight an infection so you have a higher metabolic rate, but when we're sick, especially if we're febrile, we don't eat very much. It's a classic setup for catabolism. Surgery, our body is healing just injured, is healing. Uh, surgeons typically don't put uh, post-op patients on enough calories. They are catabolic. Steroids are inherently promote catabolism. Vaccinations, again, rev up the immune system, and there's often fever associated with it. And basic neonatal physiology. All newborns learn, lose weight in the first week. They are, by definition, catabolic. So in all of these situations, the body breaks down protein, in order to redistribute those amino acids, does not do so in a regulated way. The body uses what it needs, and the rest goes to the urea cycle. If you have a problem in the urea cycle, it'll be problematic. So two scenarios when the defective urea cycle pathway is used. One is if you take in too much protein in your diet, the, some of it will go to the urea cycle, or if you take too little in, catabolism releases an excess, some of which will end up going to the urea cycle. So, question. And this is where you'll take your, um, your remotes. You have, should have an eye remote. Make sure you click the on-off button in the sort of the upper right. Make sure it works. You should see it uh, should signal a double A. And uh, when that's ready, um, there are the um, uh, five choices here, A, B, C, D, or E, which uh, relate to the answers up, up there. So um, actually, where is the? Uh, one sec. Where's the eye click? One sec. There we go. Hmm. Excuse me. Yeah. Does work? All right, we'll just have to go with that. All right. So for one of Zoe's, uh, for one of the, f which one of the following is the most likely trigger for Zoe's crisis? Is it A, protein overload? Is it B, hormonal change? Is it C, catabolism? Is it D, liver failure? Or is it E, psychological stress? And I don't know why we're not showing it up there. So could I have a show of hands, who thinks this is protein overload that caused Zoe's crisis? Who thinks it's hormonal change? Who thinks it's catabolism? All right, liver failure and psychological stress. Well, in fact, it's true. She had problems with chronic nausea and vomiting, and once you get into nausea and vomiting, it sets off this cascade of more of not taking enough calories, not taking enough calories. So let's look at the second case. This case is of a late onset urea cycle disorder. Another one, a 21 year old woman completes a normal pregnancy, labor, and delivery. Eight days postpartum, she develops a headache and confusion. She soon becomes uncommunicative, admitted to psych, and she is diagnosed with postpartum depression. Within 24 hours, she falls into coma, has a seizure with an eye exam that shows papilledema. 
A CT scan of the brain is normal. Her ammonia measures 226, normal less than 40. An EEG tracing shows only slowing, typical for a metabolic uh, disorder. Despite lactulose therapy, the ammonia rises to 411. She undergoes hemodialysis, then the waste nitrogen scavenging medications. The ammonia normalizes, but a repeat CT, CT scan shows at that point severe cerebral edema. The patient herniates and dies. Now, so even though the ammonia normalizes, there is still a lot of ammonia in the brain that still had to come out, and uh, that ammonia in the brain had attracted water in, hence the swelling. So what you see on the outside, it takes about 12 to 24 hours to, to, for the brain to respond. So in this situation, um, which one of the following is the most likely trigger for the case crisis in case two? Is it A, protein overload? B, hormonal change? C, catabolism? Uh, D, liver failure, and E, psychological stress. Well, in this case, actually, it's protein overload. Why? Because in the postpartum period, the very, very muscular uterus that had held that pregnancy, all of it, it involutes. And so that generates uh, a huge protein load for a person, for a woman at that point. Women can handle that, but if a woman's urea cycle is defective, she is protein overloaded. Add to that, um, it could also be catabolism. On the top of that, um, she may not be taking in enough protein herself or in, in, at the correct times, and um, that might aggravate the situation. So the basic theory behind testing during a metabolic crisis, if you look at protein metabolism and specifically at an amino acid, um, at, at an amino acid, um, um, sorry, uh, specifically the anatomy of amino acid, when that's broken down, the nitrogen goes to the urea cycle, what's left is an organic acid. So amino acids get broken down into the ammonia component or the organic acid component, or sometimes amino acids can be changed into other things. If you want to screen for problems in the urea cycle, off to the left there, then one would look at an ammonia. If one is looking for problems in the organic acids, well, organic acids will cause a metabolic acidosis. Um, they will cause an increased anion gap. Um, and so these are the types of things that we look for. Um, abnormal blood gases, again, a primary respiratory alkalosis on the urea cycle, primary metabolic acidosis for an organic acidemia. And again, if you do blood gases, ammonia, electrolytes, and anion gaps, you really do screen for defects in protein metabolism. Not very complicated tests. It, um, and that will give you an indication of whether or not there's something going on. What is the frequency of disorders associated with um, a urea cycle? Well, it's about 1 in 8,000 to 1 in 50,000. So the question is, well, and, and you look at this from the outside and say, what is the likelihood then that I'm going to send an ammonia level and it's going to come back abnormal? And I'm going to tell you, almost never. But. Um, if you don't, if you do the fiscally prudent thing and say, see a sick patient and you're going to order IV antibiotics and work that patient up for sepsis, and then 48 hours later the cultures come back negative and then do an ammonia level, by that time the patient's brain is fried and is permanently damaged. So uh, what I would engage you is um, that an ammonia level is cheap. An ammonia level has a turnaround time of an hour. So it's not going to come back in a week, and, 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 and if the result is abnormal, it's going to shift your entire diagnostic and therapeutic approach to that patient. So uh, the point being here, get an ammonia level in anybody who has GI symptoms, uh, especially when there is uh, some degree of encephalopathy. So the epilogue of Zoe's story. So a couple of things I mentioned earlier on in my presentation was that uh, in the episodes that we had in September, uh, they said go for some follow-up blood work. Your, your liver enzymes seem a little off and go see a neurologist and get your MRI checked again. Uh, Zoe, between September and December, went through th for three blood tests. And um, on two of them, the lab called us back and sent a letter saying you needed to come back again. Uh, the, your uh, Zoe's liver, liver enzymes are off and it must be a bad test. And so finally on the third test, the, everything looked good with the liver and so she must be okay. 
So that, that's just a little something I wanted to share with everyone. Uh, the other thing is, is that um, uh, potential biases, right, with respect to diagnosis. Uh, uh, we obtained all of Zoe's medical records. I think it was almost 3,000 pages, of which my wife read almost every single page. And what was was disheartening, particularly in the uh, in the beginning stages of each hospital visit, was this. Uh, because of who she was, where she that she was going to college, that she was in a college town, that that she must have uh, it must just be drugs and alcohol, and and uh, to the point where in in one of the uh, set of notes, uh, you know, I think the comments were along the lines from the doctors that while there can't really be something seriously wrong with her, she's still managing to send text messages while she's laying in the hospital bed. So just some other thoughts I wanted to wanted to share about Zoe's experience. Unfortunately, three days after the person who received her liver and kidney passed away, and uh, at that time we were told that uh, he had some other very serious health issues that, that contributed to his death, but th there was no nothing uh, else out of the ordinary with respect to um, that notification. Approximately one month after uh, Zoe died, we did receive a call from the Arizona Donor Network, and uh, they were reading a letter to me over the phone that they had received and it basically said that the gentleman who had received Zoe's liver had died as a result of a liver disorder passed on from Zoe to the liver recipient and that genetic testing determined that Zoe had suffered uh, from an inherited urea cycle disorder known as OTC deficiency or ornithine transcarbolamylase deficiency. Um, you know, we're, we're, uh, it, it's an inherited Typically, it is an inherited uh, disease. If if the daughters have it, it usually is comes from the father. If the sons have it, it's usually been passed on uh, from the mother. Uh, we were all genetically tested. Uh, I I was the one that passed on the uh, the gene to Zoe. Mine was not. My case was not inherited. It was as a result of something going wrong during conception. So I have what's called the mosaic type, and um, I'm a to the doctors at uh, Texas Children's Hospital. I'm, I'm somewhat of a uh, uh, walking miracle with respect to uh, uh, my OTC deficiency. Uh, you know, we spent 10 days at Banner University Medical actually living in the hospital room with Zoe and with the doctors. And uh, in the video, I, my wife mentioned it, that you know the nurses and doctors did an outstanding job based on, on what we were seeing. And again, you, you don't know what you don't know. And uh, I always like to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Bloom and the 30 plus people that, that focused on, on working on Zoe as well as the medical students and residents. The, uh, the other thing I would, I would highly suggest, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer uh, by profession. Everything is facts and data for me. Uh, for doctors, for you guys, it, it is an art and science. And uh, but do do listen to moms when they have some sort of intuition. Uh, for ten days, every time the liver specialist came into that off into that hospital room, uh, my my wife would say to them, "Please check her liver. Please check her liver. There's something wrong with her liver." And and that was a result of you know those blood tests being bad. Renee just had some intuition that hey, there's something wrong with her liver. But unfortunately, an ammonia test was never done. Uh, we've been very fortunate uh, to be working with, with, with uh, folks to try to help bring more awareness to OTC, to the medical community. Uh, as you've seen, my, my wife worked with the National Recycle Disorder to put the video together. There's also been a New York Times article written about Zoe's case in a, uh, uh, a Saturday uh, medical magazine that they publish. And NBC actually uh, did an episode, I think, of it's called Chicago Med. Uh, six or seven months ago that also uh, tackled OTC deficiency. They, they changed the characters around a little bit, but it was blatantly obvious that someone at, N at NBC had read the uh, New York Times article and decided to do an episode on it. Uh, lastly, uh, again, um, uh, I just want to say uh, to the medical professionals here that, you know, she was a person, she was our daughter, she was a sister, and to us she was just another, not just another patient. So. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And so just to uh, round out the hour, so if you're thinking about metabolic, what, what can you do? Let's say, you, let's say you did your ammonia level 
and oh my god, you have an ammonia level of 400 micromolar. So here's, uh, um, if you have a known patient with a known disorder, often they will carry around a doctor, uh, uh, an emergency protocol. Now walk in with that. That is, um, that takes the responsibility off patients for having to explain what ornithine transcript amylase deficiency is and how to assess it. All the information is there with contact information. That'll save you. Um, and in treating these, but in, in treating these, these patients, um, whether or not you have a protocol, just remember you have to support ventilation. Um, just watch out because at some point, if it's as it progresses, they'll become apneic. The only way to get rid of ammonia is to pee it out. So you want to make sure they're there, and, and there's other neurotoxins associated like glutamine. Uh, so they have to be well hydrated. You want to give them lots of sugar. You want to reduce catabolism. And the early, quickest way of doing that is just flooding them with sugar. How much sugar? What's well, basically 10, it's the, you can figure it out, you can calculate what the hepatic glucose production rate is and override it, but roughly it is 10% dextrose at one and a half times maintenance. Um, if you're worried about brain edema, then you can run a lower amount and yeah, you can put in a central line and give a higher amount of sugar at a lower volume. <clears throat> but it's basically D10 at one and a half gives them what you need to damp the catabolism <clears throat> at least for the first 24 to 48 hours. Obviously, if there's a trigger that set this off, like an acute infection or too much, um, you, you treat that aggressively. Um, if there was too much protein in the diet, you, you cut off protein and so on. <clears throat> there are, um, there, there exists specific um, um, waste nitrogen scavengers and enzyme activators that one can use. You need to uh, get a geneticist to help you with that. And certainly if the patient is comatose, if the ammonia is too high, the medications are just a drop in the bucket. You really need to call the renal service and get hemodialysis. But do employ a geneticist. A geneticist has done this before, and if you need to find them, uh, you can look at the American Board of Medical Genetics to find who is near you. There are also emergency protocols online. <clears throat> and um, if you look below it, there's the New England Consortium of Metabolic Programs. They actually have these illness protocols to follow if necessary, uh, if you're in that situation. But I would strongly advise you simply to find the nearest metabolic center. Everyone gets into these situations where we help. So in summary, metabolic crises can have fairly nonspecific signs and symptoms. You have to think metabolic. Things that will make you think of it, Think if GI, but altered mental status, especially if these are, these are recurring situations. Common triggers of a metabolic crisis are generally catabolism. Basic biochemical testing, look at the tests you send out, uh, blood gases, electrolytes, bicarbonate glucose, and ammonia in a patient, again, with those symptoms. Um, and while waiting for the results, um, or if, and if you get results that are concerning, hydrate them and give a lot of sugar, treat the triggers, and call metabolism. So one last question. Which one of the following blood gases uh, is typically associated with acute hyperaminemia due to a urea cycle defect? Is it A, is it B, is it C, or is it D? Okay, so yes, um, the answer there is D. So you're looking at a primary respiratory alkalosis. So again, you see there PCO2 is 18. That's a respiratory alkalosis. There is a metabolic acidosis there, but the pH tells you what the primary event is. The primary event is the respiratory alkalosis with a metabolic acidosis compensation. So that's the kind of thing that you will see early on in a crisis. As the patient becomes apneic, then the blood gases start to change because perfusion drops and you get a, a metabolic acidosis increasing and so on. So the final point, most patients with a metabolic disorder like OTC deficiency live and die without a diagnosis being made. So please join me in helping make sure that we never miss a metabolic disorder. Thank you very much. All right, any, any questions? Yes. I would like to thank you guys for coming to talk to me today. Uh, thank you. Really uh, and uh, at least the people who are in the room have a different question that uh, you can get to my patients that uh, that's in the main time that you can come to me and say, thank you. Thank you. 
Yes. So, so, so the question is newborn screening. Is, is this, so um, there are six different disorders in, newborn, in the urea cycle. Um, and actually three of them, well, two disorders are screened in every state in the union. Uh, a bunch more screen for uh, a third one, and they're all distal in the urea cycle. The most common of the disorders, though, is OTC deficiency because it's the only one that's X-linked. All the others are recessive. And in and OGC deficiency, in two-thirds of cases, the abnormal mutation is inherited from a parent. So that's why the frequency is up. The problem with OTC deficiency is besides the ammonia, which you can't measure ammonia as a newborn screening analyte, it's too unstable. And, um, but um, the, the marker for newborn screening is something that's low, and, and with, uh, citrulline, basically. And low things, and citrulline is normally low in the newborn period anyway, so most programs do not feel comfortable reporting out a low um, finding. Some states are starting to utilize a, a composite of different things, the low citrulline plus the high glutamine plus and certain other things, and they're having some success. So probably about five states are now screening for OTC and CPS deficiency. And they're sort of piloting this program to see if they can pick it up. So it's just, it's because there's something that's not sky high, which is what, usually what we look for in newborn screening. But they're working on it to see if they can identify a combination of things that'll uh, correctly identify an affected person without a, a lot of false positives. Yes. Right. So the question is, um, in a pediatric setting, when a patient comes in with nausea and vomiting, which is pretty common, and it's often due to some sort of viral illness, most commonly, um, so one wouldn't do um, an ammonia level. So in the absence, so what I would say is, if the nausea and vomiting is, is regular, so not, if it's a singular event and the patient's not um, encephalopathic, then I think treat what you see and what's most likely. If there's a history of recurrent nausea and vomiting, especially if some of those periods are associated with encephalopathy, um, but not all of them, that's a candidate that I would draw. So ask about the previous history of nausea and vomiting and or encephalopathy. If this is a recurring theme, then somebody should get a pneumonia level. And the pneumonia level should be obtained best when the symptoms are there. Don't refer the patient to GI, and then the GI person sees and, and the mother then talks about a, a history of nausea and vomiting, but the kid looks great at that time. If the kid looks great at that time, you may not find the high ammonia level. Other questions? Well, thank you again for coming out and, and listening, and thank you so very, very much for telling a very personal story, but, but one that I think we'll never, we'll never forget. And so we'll take it to our clinical practices. Thank you.